Greetings and welcome back to Room 303 and our series of conversations with the Harvard Classics Volume 4. This is Lecture 25 over Paradise Lost Book 11, The Beginning of the End, Exile with a Vision First, we might say. We'll get to why. Uh, if you haven't uh, yet watched the preceding lectures for our study of Paradise Lost, I really do recommend that you turn now to LearnStrong.net, my site, go down that left-hand side, find that folder there, and study our old lectures. That way you feel comfortable with the comments that we are about to make. We're going to build off of a lot of those, just to though finish with Book 10. And we said this at the beginning of our last lecture over Book 9, just to show you that we are in fact working at just the epidermal level of this text. Let me make a couple of quick observations for you about Book 10 before we get into Book 11 that I hope maybe will give you some pause for thought. In our comments about Shakespeare over, the, over our time together, I pointed out that one of the great games you can play is to take a look at the very first words spoken by main character, Hamlet, a little less than kin and less than uh, a little more than kin and less than kind, and the last words spoken by that character. The rest is silence. Let's play the same game with book number ten. For example, very quickly, just for a second, go with me back into book ten and take a look at, for example, the last words spoken by Satan. Is, I, mean, I think this is a fascinating question. What are the last words spoken by, by Satan? And more particularly, what's the last word spoken by Satan? Now, I'm in, I'm in uh, book number 10, line 307. Um, uh, and and this, one, uh, this one for us, I'm sorry, line uh, 507. Let's, let's, look at, let's look at this for just a second here. Well, uh, love, roughly line 500. I'm going to start on page 500, uh, on line 500, okay? He says, that which to me belongs is... He, and by the way, he's speaking to the demonic angels as he's returned back to hell. That which to me belongs is enmity, which he will put between me and mankind. I am to bruise his heel. His seed, which is not set, shall bruise my head. Uh, Genesis 3.15. A world who would not purchase with a bruise or much more grievous pain. In other words, he says, I mean, really, a bruise? Who cares? Ye have the account of my performance... What remains, ye gods, but up and enter now into full bliss? The last word spoken by Satan in Paradise Lost is the word bliss. Of course, notice the sound, which is going to work well because, of course, all of the demonic angels, including Satan himself, are about to turn into snakes. How about this one? What is the last word spoken by sin and death. Think about this one. The last words spoken uh, by Sen. Uh, line 600. To this, to thus the sinborn monster answered soon, to me, who with eternal famine pine alike is hell or paradise or heaven, their best must most with ravine I may meet, where here, though plenteous, all too little seems to stuff this small, this vast unhide bound corpse. This is death. Now, to whom the incestuous mother thus replied, Sin. Sin's final words. Thou therefore on these herbs and fruits and flowers feed first, on each beast next, fish and fowl no homely morsels, and whatever thing the scythe of time now mows down, devour unspared, till I, in man residing through the race, his thoughts, his looks, words, actions, all in fact, and season him thy last and sweetest pray, P-R-E-Y. Now, of course, what's fascinating about this word pray is that it, of course, has a second spelling, P-R-A-Y. And that's a fascinating word. So let's go to the second thing. Notice, for example, the first mention of prayer in Paradise Lost as it relates to Adam and to Eve happens at around line 952. Now, I find this fascinating. 952, um, um, Adam will say it, if prayers could alter high decrees, I to that place would speed before thee and be louder heard, that on my head all might be visited. Adam 
saying that he wishes somehow for forgiveness. Prayer is again mentioned at line um, 1060 um, really quickly. If we pray him, will his ear be open and his heart to pity incline? And then finally, 1090, um, the, uh, to, to finish out um, our, our lines together, he prostrate fell at line 1100 before him reverent at line 10, uh, at line roughly 1090, pardon, beg with tears. Question, why does prayer only get spoken of after the fall? Before the fall, lots of singing, lots of hymns and the like. Why all of a sudden do we have so much about praying after the fact? And we're going to see prayer mentioned in the second line of the opening book, uh, of the opening lines of book 11. Very interesting. Well, let's go ahead and now finish our introductory comments. Book 11 and 12 are in many ways a unit. We're going to have the great Archangel Michael who is going to come and present in the form of a speech, a vision of the future. Very much like Virgil's Aeneid Book 6 and the Odyssey of Homer's 10 and 11, when both of the two epic heroes of those two poems are needing to know the future and wanting to be given the important inf information of the future. Hey, let's review for just a moment before we continue. Uh, part one, books one through four, all of our characters are introduced for us, of course. And yes, of course, we have the major events of the performance, the drama about to unfold happening there. In part two, books five through eight, we have that flashback where Raphael's going to tell the story of Satan's fall from heaven uh, into hell and uh, the warnings that are a part of that. And then, of course, part three begins with book nine, the fall, and then book ten, the fall out, as we talked about it in an earlier lecture. Now, finally, to book eleven, the exile notice, Michael is going to come to Adam and Eve and say, you're out, you're out. Just to review, three levels of reading. Level one, what does the text say? Level two, what does the text mean? Level three, how do we relate to the text? And, of course, we'll follow that same modus operandi as we have for all of our earlier lectures. Remember, we're studying Paradise Lost as epic. Though we're also looking at it as philosophic and theological text, especially as it relates to the question of just, justice, divine justice, and theodicy. And finally, we're looking at Paradise Lost as a political text, both from the psychological perspective and the sociological perspective. We'll have obviously much more to say about this here in a bit. Okay, let's turn now to the 11th book, Let's read as we've done in the past the argument, give a brief plot summary, and then get right into our study. The 11th book, The Argument. The Son of God presents to his Father the prayers of our first parents now repenting and intercedes for them. God accepts them, but declares that they must no longer abide in paradise. Sends Michael with a band of cherubim to dispossess them, but first to reveal to Adam future things. Michael's coming down, Adam shows to Eve certain ominous signs. He discerns their, uh, he discerns Michael's approach, goes out to meet him. The angel denounces their departure. Eve's lamentation, it's an important word and we'll want to write that one down, Eve's lamentation. Adam pleads but submits. The angel leads him up to a high hill, sets before him in vision what shall happen till the flood. And we will end the text with the flood. Now let's do a brief Really quick plot summary for those of you that need this kind of information, and I think it works very nicely to have a schemata before we get started. Three basic parts to, to uh, Book 11. One, God sends Michael with, our, with the angels to, uh, to uh, make sure that the important information is shared. Of course, part, uh, part two of this book, Michael will tell them, it's over. You're banished. You will be thrown out. There's going to be, obviously, some sad that will be associated with that. It's one of those things where you kind of do something and you don't really understand the ripple effects. All of us at 3B could jot down in a moment in our life when this probably happened for us, when we did not realize the ripple effects, the implications of our actions. And then once those implications become known to us, we kind of go, no way, and it kind of blows us away. Finally, Michael, at the end of this book, is going to show Adam the future in a series of comments that will be very revelatory. We'll obviously get into it. Let's open books, uh, book 11. The first eight lines. Just Let's just read together. And again, as I said in every one of my lectures, 
I would love to read every line of this poem with you. It would be so much fun for me, but I just don't have the time to do it. So we're obviously going to have to move rather quickly to be able to get everything covered here. So let's, be let's begin, though, with opening lines. Thus, they, Adam and Eve, in lowliest plight, repentant, let's say that that makes them different from Satan right away, who once thrown out of hell, out of heaven, is ready in hell to create pandemonium and to go to works, to overthrow God. Here, notice, repentant, stood, praying. Again, we're back to this notion of prayer as it happening, it seems, only after the fall. For from the mercy seat above, prevenant grace, descending had removed the stony from their hearts and made new flesh regenerate grow instead. That sighs now breathe unutterable, which the spirit of prayer inspired and winged for heaven with speedier flight than loudest oratory. Let's just point out that for Milton the Puritan, instead of being loud in your prayers and being predictable in the rhythms of your prayers, Milton is going to give far more credence to a notion of a prayer that is going to be not from a stony heart, but from a soft heart. At line 21, we are told that the Son will intercede, that is to say, speak on behalf of Adam and Eve. This is already Christian theology finding its way into our poem, of course. And at line 45, God is going to respond with cloud serene. All thy request for man, accepted son, obtain. All thy request was my decree, but longer in that paradise to dwell the law I gave to nature him forbids paradise lost those pure immortal elements that know no gross no unharmonious mixture foul eject him tainted now and purge him off as a, as a distemper gross to air as gross wow in other words it's over the two gifts that humans have experienced, we'll learn in a few lines later, happiness and immortality, now gone. At line 72, a trumpet will bring all of the uh, uh, angels assembled uh, together. And at line 84, we now will have the almighty God speaking. O oh, sons, like one of us man has become to know both good and evil, since his taste of that defended tree, uh, defended fruit, but let him boast his knowledge of good lost and evil got. Happier had it sufficed him to have known good by itself and evil not at all. Now, of course, much has been made of this. We think of Blake's Songs of Innocence, Songs of Experience, and go back to those lectures that I've given on Songs of Innocence, Songs of Experience. Can you actually know good without knowing also evil or bad? Eve, we're going to learn in this, she doesn't realize what paradise was for her, what Eden was for her, until she's eaten of the forbidden fruit and is about to be uh, jettisoned from the Garden of Eden. And then only then can she truly appreciate, as they sometimes say, you only know what you have once, and how important it is, once, of course, you no longer have it. To continue, he sorrows now repents and prays contrite my motions in him longer than they move his heart i know how variable and vain self left lest therefore his now bolder hand reach also of the tree of life and eat and live forever dream at least to live forever to remove him i decree and send him from the garden forth to till the ground whence he was taken fitter soil michael this my behest have thou in charge. Take to thee from among the cherubim thy choice of flaming warriors, lest the fiend, Satan, or in behalf of man, or to invade vacant possessions, some new trouble raise. Haste thee, and from the paradise of God without remorse, drive out the sinful pair from hallowed ground, the unholy, and denounce to them and to their progeny from thence perpetual banishment. Now, of course, that word banishment will bring to mind Romeo and Juliet, right? Remember when Romeo keeps saying it over and over again? Banish it, banish it, banish it. That notion of I've got to I've got to leave Verona and go to Mantua and all of that, right? Um, the the uh, line one uh, one one four. Now um, he says that you're going to tell Adam to Adam 
You're going to tell what shall come in future days as I shall the enlightened intermix my covenant in the woman's seed renewed back to the Genesis 3.15. Um, and then, uh, um, uh, so send them forth, though sorrowing yet in peace, and on the east side of the garden place where entrance up from Eden easiest climbs, cherubic watch, and of a sword the flame wide waving, all approach far off to fright and guard all passage to the tree of life, lest paradise a receptacle prove to spirits foul, and all my trees their prey, with whose stolen fruit man once more to delude. In other words, it's over, and there will no be never any return to Eden, to paradise. By the way, this Up From Eden will be the title of a famous book by a, a philosopher I've mentioned already, Ken Wilbur, and we're going to ask this question about the leaving of Eden. We're also going to ask this question, I'll set you up for it already. Even if you don't believe in the story of Genesis 3 and the departure from Eden as a literal story, what about as a metaphoric story for you? The idea that have you ever been in a situation that was really pretty remarkable, relationship or whatever, and then paradise lost? And what is it like to lose paradise? Let's keep going. At line 126, the angels are going to come to earth. At line 141, Adam is going to say to Eve that he thinks maybe prayer might work because things maybe, he says, I, he's feeling that maybe things are getting better. Yet at line 146, this will prayer, or one short sigh of human breath unborn, even to the seed of God. For since I sought by prayer the offended deity to appease, kneeled, and before him humbled all my heart, methought I saw him placable and mild, bending his ear, Adam hoping that maybe prayer will work. At line 158, he says that at least we have a future because of you. So for a moment, here, notice that Adam will step away from his condemnation of women and Eve and say it. Whence hail to thee? We're working here at line 158. Hail to thee. By the way, obviously, that's the opening line of hail to thee by spirit. The opening lines of Shelley's um, um, To a Skylark, a text that we've taught in here before. Hail to thee, Eve rightly called mother of all mankind, mother of all things living, since by thee man is to live, and all things live for man. At line 162, Eve will apologize in her sad demeanor meek. She says, I'm sad, ill worthy I, such titles should belong to me, transgressor who for thee ordained a help became thy snare, and to me reproach rather belongs, distrust and all dispraise. Um, Eve again is going to make the statement that it's all my fault. Line 176, she says it, let us forth, I never from thy sight henceforth to stray, where'er our day's work lies, though now enjoined laborious till day droop. In other words, she says, I'm never going to leave your sight again. Of course, we will read this as, you know, Milton's, uh, again, in, injunction of the patriarchy. Women should always be with their men. Of course, we're going to ask, how much of this, you know, you as a modern, postmodern reader can stomach? Um, where our day's work lies, while here we dwell, what can be toilsome in these pleasant walks? Let us live, though in fallen state, content. Uh, she believes they're, they're, they're just going to get to live in Eden uh, for the rest of their lives together. And she says, hey, at least we're going to be together and at least we're in Eden. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine and we can be content. We think of those final lines, of course, of Longfellow's Psalm of Life, a text that we've all committed to memory. Let us then be up and doing with a heart for any faith, still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor and to wait. That idea of being content. We're, we're going to be fine. We're going to be fine. Um, uh, however, line 193, Adam's reading the signs, animals against animals, he knows something big is happening, he can see the signs coming at line 193 and following, and then Adam says to Eve at line 226, Eve, now expect great tidings, which perhaps of us will soon determine or impose new laws to be observed. In other words, he says it. I, I kind of have a feeling maybe we're about to get jacked here. And then, of course, he sees Michael is about to show up. At line 237, he's going to ask Eve to retire. Michael, the archangel, will show up. 
um, here we're told he doesn't show up socially mild the way Raphael did. Hey, let's have a conversation. But rather, this is Michael the Arch Archangel showing up with that sword that, of course, Satan is so frightened of. Many readers of this poem have asked, why in heaven's name wasn't Michael involved much earlier to jack Satan? And again, it goes back to Milton's theodicy. No, no. Satan needed to be allowed into paradise to test both Adam and Eve to see if, in fact, they would meet the test. At line 251, Eve is out of the room, but she is eavesdropping. She is listening, and she's going to hear what it is that Michael has to say. At line 251, the hammer will drop. Adam, Michael speaking. Adam, heaven's high behest no preface needs, sufficient they that prayers, sufficient that thy prayers are heard. And death, then do by sentence when thou didst transgress, defeated of his seizure many days given thee of grace, wherein thou mayest repent, and one bad act with many deeds well done may us cover. You're not going to die right away. Maybe you can somehow, with enough good deeds, begin to overcome the bad deed. Well, may then my Lord, thy Lord appeased, redeem thee quite from death's rapacious claim. But longer in this paradise to dwell permits not. To remove thee I am come, and send thee from the garden forth to till the ground whence thou wast taken, fitter soil. He added not. For Adam, at the news, heart struck, with chilling gripe of sorrow stood, that all his senses bound. Eve, who unseen yet all had heard, with audible lament, discovered soon the place of her retire. She begins to cry. Oh, unexpected stroke, worse than of death. Must I thus leave thee paradise, thus leave thee native soil, these happy walks and shades, fair haunts of God, of gods, where I had hoped to spend quiet, though sad, the respite of the day, of that day, that must be mortal to us both. Oh, flowers that will never in other climate grow, my early visitation, and